You're listening to 15 Minutes, where we feature community leaders sharing what the rest of us should know but likely don't. Hello, listeners. I'm Bela Musitz, host for this episode of the 15 Minutes Share Your Voice podcast, where we talk with top-notch law firms and attorneys about what it takes to grow a successful law practice. This episode is brought to you by Gladiator Law Marketing. They deliver tailor-made services to help your law firm accomplish its objectives and maximize your growth potential. To have a successful marketing campaign and to make sure you're getting the best return on investment, your firm needs to have a better website and better content. Gladiator Law Marketing uses artificial intelligence, machine learning, and decades of experience to outperform the competition. To learn more, go to gladiatorlawmarketing.com where you can schedule a free marketing consultation. Today's guest on the podcast is attorney Mervat Mohammed. Mervat is the principal attorney at Kiswani Law Firm. Mervat's primary focus is on divorce, custody, adoption, and child support cases, along with prenuptial and postnuptial agreements. Attorney Mervat has further been trained as a mediator through the Northwestern University's mediation program. Welcome to the podcast, Mervat. Thank you for having me. Sure. So tell us a little bit more about Kiswani Law Firm. Kiswani Law Firm has been around for about nine years now. It primarily handles family law. Uh, it is essentially all that we do, which would include divorce, child custody. I also represent children, including being a guardian ad litem, a child representative in Cook County and in DuPage County. And uh, we love what we do. Yeah, wow. So that, you know, divorce, uh, separations, custody battles, things like that, sounds like uh, those are challenging cases because there's probably a lot of emotion involved. Right. Uh, that must take like a special set of skills on your part. Right. So for a lot of family law attorneys, you're acting as a counselor, uh, mm. an attorney, and sometimes even an emotional therapist. But I would think that the best family law attorneys encourage their clients to seek an individual therapist because we are not trained to be therapists. So I can hear my client venting, but I don't necessarily have the advice to help them cope with their emotional struggles because divorce is traumatic. It is hard. It is difficult. You know, only once in a while you will see a quote unquote easy divorce. And that's usually for people who really want a divorce are on the same page and most likely have not been married for very long. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, do the laws vary uh, state by state, I would imagine, in this country? Is that correct? They do. They do. So the, the laws in Illinois are probably a little different than the laws in Indiana and in Florida, et cetera. Yeah. But within a state, are the laws the same or do, are there variations within a state? So in the state of Illinois, the law is all the same when it comes to divorce and custody. But of course, you know, can things be different depending on how a judge rules in one county to mm. another or by one case to another? Of course, because the facts are probably different. The players, you know, the parties are probably different. What they file may be different. How they react may be different. And all of that impacts the outcome of your divorce or custody battle. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. So do do these types of cases go to trial or, you know, with a jury, sort of, you know, what everyone's thinking about going to court or are these different? Well, luckily in Illinois, there is no jury trial for divorce and child custody cases. So you're only up in front of the judge. And yes, they do go to trial if there is no settlement. OK, so. In essence, uh, you would plead your your plaintiff's case to the judge, the other side would plead their case, and then the judge makes the decision. Right. And like any trial, if you have witnesses, witnesses can appear, witnesses mm. can testify, you have to present your evidence. And, you know, it's not just about, oh, my God, I want a divorce or, oh, my God, I don't want a divorce. There are so many other things that go under the umbrella of a divorce, including property, who's getting what property, what the value of the property is. Is there any debt? Are we talking about child support? Are we talking about alimony? 
Um, you know, is there a dissipation claim? Has someone spent funds in a way that they weren't supposed to? So usually cases that go to trial are a little bit more complex than the usual cases because there's usually some sort of money at play, whether that's assets, support, or even debt. So who's going to pay the debt? Mm, yeah, boy, it does sound complicated. Typically, if, if something does go to trial, uh, you know, so it's that contentious, I would imagine. Yes. Uh, how long does that whole process typically take? My goodness. So I have had trials that have lasted, you know, one day and have other trials that have lasted two weeks. So, you know, the way that a case starts ramping up for trial is if there is no settlement. And usually attorneys try to talk settlement within, I would think, the pre-discovery phase and even within the discovery phase. But in order for a case to get to the point of trial, and it's that contentious, it has probably been around for longer than six months in the court system. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. So I can imagine it in these types of uh, cases that you handle, clients you deal with, uh, sometimes the cultural norms are different than the law. So I can imagine that makes it really much more difficult. How do you sort of deal with that? So I have been lucky enough to um, be given the opportunity to represent people from an array of life and an array of culture and heritage. Um, and everyone's culture does play a role in their marriage and sometimes in what results in their divorce. So you have to have an honest discussion with your clients. Whatever is acceptable in the culture may not be acceptable in the law. Mm -hmm. And whatever is acceptable for a result of a divorce in culture may not be acceptable in the law or vice versa. So I can give an example um, a large amount of my clients are Middle Eastern. A large amount of them are Muslim. So the way that the divorce laws would work religiously or ideally under a Muslim state are very different than the laws in the state of Illinois. I usually deal with the issues of whether or not dowry is going to be upheld in the state of Illinois, whether there's going to be issues of custody because maybe religiously father would you know, by default, get custody up to a certain age and mom will yes. get custody to a certain age. But that's not the way that it plays out in the state of Illinois. So that just needs to be talked about. And the realities of how the law is applied needs to be discussed very early on in the case. Yeah, yeah. So if, if there are differences between those two norms, uh, between what goes on in Illinois and, let's say, the cultural norms, if the two parties agree that the they're okay with the cultural norms. Is that an acceptable settlement or does, does, does the state guidelines rule? So the parties can always come up with an agreement, but the agreement has to be legal. It has to be binding and it has to be equitable. And a judge has to review that agreement. So you can agree mm. to whatever you'd like, but if a judge does not find that equitable, then most yeah. likely the judge is not going to enter it. So then it goes back to the attorneys to, again, advise and counsel their clients as to what it is that they're agreeing to. One, make sense. Two, can it be entered? Can it be legally binding? Um, and of course, as attorneys, we want to make sure that it doesn't come back and get either dismissed or vacated later or, you know, cause a humongous legal battle. Right. after. That. Yeah, right. well, that all makes sense. So tell us a little bit more about mediation. Uh, you went back, got some special training for that. Uh, uh, expand on that a little bit for us. I, I love mediation because um, I do think that divorce and custody battles sometimes get lost in a rabbit hole when it comes to litigating them, especially when people's emotions are involved. Mediation is a great process for people who want to sit at the kitchen table and talk out their problems in hopes of coming up with solutions that really work for them and that aren't determined by a stranger, which in this case would be a judge, who would simply rule regardless of how you felt about that outcome. So I have been practicing mediation and the parties that have come to me for mediation do walk out happier, I would say, than you know, parties that go to trial, mm. because in the end, in mediation, you do get to discuss your problems and it is amicable and it's okay to disagree. 
But in the end, you want to find a solution that works for both you, the other person, and if children are involved, then for the children. Because in the end, you get to then have control over your life versus a judge implementing whatever it is that they see fit onto you. And then you have to live by that. Yeah. So I'm hoping that in the future that there would be more encouragement for parties to actually seek mediation versus totally litigating everything out in the court system. Yeah. So uh, help me understand a little bit how it would work. So the, the two parties would come to you and sit down with you in multiple sessions and hammer sort of things out and, and come to an right. agreement. So both parties have to agree to want to do mediation. It wouldn't work if one party doesn't want to do right. mediation. Right. So they both need to agree that they want to do mediation. I've had parties either reach out together to me or I have separate phone calls with the parties. Uh, Sometimes I even meet with them together in person or separately, depending on what it is that they want. Once I meet with them, we come up with an agreement as to when we're meeting, how we're meeting and the times. This all needs to be, of course, agreeable to both sides. Once that happens, I do usually have three sessions to discuss whether it's finances or custody issues, and then we just do it in three session blocks. And a lot of these sessions can get very emotional. We do have to take some breaks. Sometimes I have to break up what the big problem is between the parties into sub issues, and we kind of knock them out one issue at a time. Um, And I would say usually by the third or fourth mediation session, we've talked about the majority of the issues and we can at least categorize this is what we're in agreement with and then this is what we're going to work out whether we have to step away from mediation for a little bit and come back and resolve it or we want another session right away to resolve it so it really depends on the parties and how they want to move forward well that really sounds like some intense counseling sessions to me (laughs) it can be yeah now (laughs) let's say once you once you get an agreement in, in mediation, does it then need to go and get approved by a judge? So this is what happens. The mediator, if I'm acting as a mediator, I cannot also act as an attorney for the parties. So as a mediator, if there is an agreement, I will draft something called the memorandum of understanding. And usually the parties, at least one of them might have an attorney. And if they don't, that's okay. They can represent themselves pro se, but they have to convert that memorandum of understanding to a judgment, to an order, and then put it into the court system and be entered in order for it to be enforceable. If you don't enter anything in court, then everything and anything you've agreed in mediation is not enforceable at all. Okay, understand. Well, this has been very informative. That's that's very, very nice. Thank you for explaining all of that. So- uh, Tell us, tell me a little bit. I'm always curious. This, you know, is a pretty specialized uh, piece of the law or section of the law, practice of the specialty. And, you know, a lot of emotion evolved. Uh, as you said, you find yourself to be a counselor often uh, in helping people get through these very difficult times. What made you choose going into this segment of the law? I always say you don't choose family law, it chooses you. Not everyone is really cut out to be a family law attorney. Um, It is highly emotional. It can be very complex and very heavy at times. When I graduated law school, the economy wasn't in its best shape. Mm. I actually did not choose family law. I was looking to be more of a business litigation attorney, commercial litigation, and that's what I was looking for. But one of my friends was uh, working at a smaller law firm and she reached out to me and she said, hey, we have a position open. Come and join us at this family law firm. And I said, okay, like, fine, I'll go ahead and join them and start there. Started there. I ended up falling in love with family law. Um, and after about a year and a half, I opened up my own practice and I have not strayed away from family law since then. I have met a couple of attorneys who thought family law was for them you know, only for them to run away from it after one case. (laughs) So uh, I don't think family law is for everyone. I do think it is an acquired taste, if you want to use that statement, for uh, practicing law. Yeah, yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, I have another curious question here. You said you went to went you worked for a law firm uh, that was doing family law. You fell in love with it. Then you decided to open up your own law firm. 
T- tell me a little bit about that decision of, of, of hanging your own signal, so to speak, and going out on your own. Yeah. So I come from a family of entrepreneurs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, everyone owns a small business. So it was kind of something that was expected, something that ran in my blood that I just wanted to be my own boss. So I was a little fearful of it. I was a little scared. I was still a new attorney. Um, but I would say that my mom and dad definitely encouraged me to go out and hang my own shingle. Um, but it was exciting and it's worked out for the last nine years. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds great. So if, if there's an, a, a, you know, some attorneys listening to this uh, a podcast and, and they're sitting in their big corporate law firm uh, uh, offices and they have these inklings of going out on their own, uh, what advice would you give them? Do your research. I made sure that I reached out to multiple attorneys that opened up their own law firm before I opened up mine. And I would say a lot of these attorneys did not know me at all. Mm -hmm. I called their office, I introduced myself, and I told them exactly what it is that I was looking for. And I invited them out for a cup of coffee. I also reached out to professors of mine that did introduce me to current mentors who've practiced family law, and they definitely helped me setting up my shingle, telling me exactly what to do. For for example, I know that my mentor um, stressed malpractice insurance, 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 Mm -hmm. insurance, especially for a younger attorney. And as a younger attorney, I just would not have thought of that as such a important part of practice Mm -hmm. um, unless my mentor had, had took me. So I would say do your research. It's not as glamorous as some people make it out to be. It's a lot of hard work. But if you are willing to put in that hard work and you're willing to, um, you know, kind of wear all the hats, at least in the beginning, then it's worth it. Uh, If you do think that your job right now as an associate or working somewhere else is very stressful, owning your own law firm is just as stressful, if not more. So that's my bit of advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine you said you're wearing all different types of hats. Uh, you know, you're an associate or a junior partner someplace. Uh, you don't have to worry about paying the rent on the building. You don't have to worry about paying the electric bill. There's all right. these things that you don't have to worry about. Now, all of a sudden, you open up your own place. You got to worry about all sorts of stuff. Right, right. And especially when you start out, because it's only you. And then yeah. slowly when you're building up your practice, you can, of course you know, assign different tasks to different people, have different departments, et cetera. But when you begin, you're the administrator, you're HR, you're the payroll, you're the attorney, you're the business person. It's all on you. So it's it's hard work in the beginning, but I mean, it was worth it for me. Yeah, that's great. Oh, that's fabulous. So when, when you uh, blaze out on your own, you know, uh, the legal profession is very competitive. There's lots of firms out there. You see advertising all the time. So how did you sort of market yourself in the beginning and get those initial clients? Uh, how, How did that process go? I definitely wanted to connect with my clients and I wanted to connect with people who are like me. I'm a first generation American. My parents are immigrants. I am a female, the first female in my family to go to college and law school. I understand the struggles that a lot of people have gone through or are going through. So I think having that human side of me is really what attracted a lot of people to retain my services. Um, I would also say speaking Arabic did help. Mm. Uh, Many attorneys in my area do speak fluent Arabic. And also being a minority has helped as well because minorities do see things in a different light. They do have different struggles. So that helped. And I think just connecting on a human level did help um, did help me attract a lot of clientele when I first opened the firm. Yeah. And and were there any big turning points once you opened up your your firm that sort of, you know, really gave you a big boost in 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 sort of uh, not only your own confidence and, and saying, hey, this is this is starting to work out and be successful, uh, but also from a business perspective? When I first opened up my law firm, I had a small office in my family's trucking business. And uh, I think that gave it a unique spin because people were like, oh, she has a office in her family's trucking business. So it was very family oriented and people knew that I had just started. 
Um, I would say that that attracted a lot of people. Within five years, I was able to open up my own office. And I think that was the turning point. After five years, um, you saw the success. You saw that you can go ahead and open up your own office without the help of family, without the help of friends. And clients saw that. And a lot of my clients have been repeat clients, not to say that they've been divorced more than once, but if you have children <laughs> who are young, it, things often change as they grow up, whether that's modifying custody judgments or support judgments or whatever it is. So they saw my growth. So I've had clients who have seen me from year one and they've been with me on year nine and they've seen the change. So the yeah. 100 degree change. And I think that's what what's attracted clients. And again, that's what's had them refer their friends and family to me as well. Oh, that's wonderful. So uh, if if uh, I'm listening to this podcast, and I'm, I'm thinking of maybe going to law school to becoming an attorney, or I'm getting ready to graduate next year, I'm in my final year, and I'm going to graduate, uh, what words of advice would you give uh, to someone like that? I would say if you have not already clerked somewhere, go out and clerk because in law school, they teach you the law. It's all theory based, but it's not real life based. And you can only go so far with a textbook. Mm -hmm. It really comes down to what you know and who you know in real life. And practicing law is very different than simply learning the law. Um, so connections and networking, I would say, should be a priority for law students if they have the ability to do it. Excellent. Now, uh, as a layperson, I often hear that wor word clerk. I clerked for this judge or I clerked here. What does that mean? So it's just assisting. So you can assist a judge. Usually for clerking for a judge, you're just observing in the courtroom. Might You might help a judge draft up a judgment or an order, but of course the judge is the one supervising it and finalizing it. Same thing with clerking in a law office. So you might be helping with the paperwork, you might absorb, observe uh, court appearances, but you're simply assisting. So oh, you're just kind of in the background assisting, but it gives you a lot of experience. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's uh, is it similar to what some places might call an internship? Yeah, but, you know, with clerks, you're usually getting paid um, as you should. I don't believe yes. that all students should work for free, but yeah, it's a paid internship. Very nice. Very nice. Sounds like a great way to, to get experience, uh, just, just as internships are. And, and some internships are paid for sure in the business world. Yeah. Uh, so one, one last question. What sort of triggered you to to go into law, to decide to go to law school? Was there an event? Did you wake up one morning and say, oh, I want to be an attorney? Uh, or was <laughs> it, you know, how did that process go? So when you grow up in a Middle Eastern family, you're either a doctor, an engineer, a lawyer. When I was in high school, I thought I was going to be a doctor. I took AP biology. I could not deal with the blood. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to make a difference in people's lives. So I figured being a lawyer would be the best way for me to help people make a difference in their life. And for family law, when people ask me, well, how are you making a difference in people's lives as a family law attorney? And I would say I'm helping them move to the next chapter of their life. So they're already in a mm. terrible relationship. Yeah. It could be abusive. It could be, you know, whether it's emotionally, physically, financially, or they're simply miserable and they need help to move past that and then get on to the next chapter of their life. So that's what family law attorneys are usually doing um, versus the stereotype that we're breaking up families. The family's already broken and they just come yeah. to us. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. So uh, where can listeners uh, learn more about you and your firm? They can go online at kiswanilawfirm.com. They can also call the office at 708-210-9247. Okay, great. I will make sure that information is in the show notes so people can find that and reach out to you. Uh, so my, my last question, is there something that I have not asked you that you would like to share with our listeners? I think we went over everything, but I would like to give a tip to attorneys in general. Yeah. I would, I would say, make sure that you have a hobby outside of practicing <laughs> law to, to balance out the stress that we have to deal with. I personally like swimming and golfing. So if you pick up a hobby outside of law, it will make a world of difference. 
Yeah. I think that's good advice for any profession. <laughs> right. <laughs> you got you got to have some interest outside of work. You have uh, to have a life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have to have a life. So uh, I, that's a great way to close the podcast. Uh, Mervat, thank you very much for being a great guest uh, on the show. I really enjoyed our conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. Thank you. Thanks for listening to 15 Minutes. Be sure to subscribe and we'll see you next time.